Hey guys, in this video I'll try to talk about car setup, what you have to do in order to change the handling of the car. The reason I'm doing it like this is because there is the proper way of doing it with spreadsheets and charts and everything that will take a week and I probably will still be unhappy about it and it will be incomplete and I'll be eh -eh doing that and it won't be released. Uh, so I'm just going to talk into the, the webcam for hopefully 10-15 minutes and see how far we can uh, get. Let's uh, first start by two things, tires, very important. What you need for them to work is load, because a tire floating in the air doesn't work all that well. And you need slip. We've mentioned this before in videos, but a tire just rolling forward doesn't generate any grip. You have to force it at a little angle, slip angle over the road, that gives you cornering. Or you have to apply the brakes and you, st you try to stop the tire and it starts dragging over the asphalt, that's slip. So we need tire load and we need tire slip. A lot of this is done by you. With steering, you move load around and you generate slip, braking, acceleration, the same thing. And there is something you can do with car setup, but a lot of it is just done by you. Um, starting, uh, I'm looking at a setup screen for AMS here, with the tire pressure. Uh, well, what sort of stuff does that influence? Well, first of all, tire pressure can be very important just for optimizing the grip of the tire. And typically there is one optimal pressure that works best for each car on each track. But it's hard to find out what that pressure is. Sometimes the devs give you like a, a, an indication. For example, with uh, most single seaters about one and a half bar, hot pressure is all right. Uh, GT cars, 1.9 bar, sort of a rule of thumb, but it depends on the sim and how it's programmed, how uh, sensitive it is to, uh, to pressure. So typically there is one optimum pressure and changing the tire pressure to change the handling is not ideal because you want front and rear tires all to be in that optimum and you can create an oversteer by going with the wrong pressure but effectively you're losing grip that way that's probably not a good idea however what tire pressure also does is that's the springiness of the tire and that's quite important uh, because we mentioned tire load is important and with uh, racing cars with very stiff suspension and stiff anti-roll bars, the springiness of the tire is actually a very important part of the suspension, so to speak. And the understeer oversteer balance, well, it's kind of the same. If you increase the tire pressure, you have sort of the same effect as adding front anti-roll bar or adding front springs. The front gets stiffer. And that means part of the reason if you increase the front uh, tire pressure, you might get more understeer because you've effectively stiffened up the front axle just like you do with springs and anti-roll bars and that tends to give you more understeer. So it's important to realize that the stiffer the race car is, the more effect you feel from the tire pressure and it's the spring rate of the, of the car. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, camber, the next tire thing, well, what you set up in the car setup is typically the static camber, the tires leaning in a little bit, but when you're driving, uh, there's some roll, so perhaps you've got negative free camber and then you take a corner and that outside tire is always the most important. It will not really see that exact camber. It will probably be two degrees instead of three degrees. And here as well, it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, tire grip will grow typically a little bit in cornering uh, with more negative camber, but you probably lose a bit of braking and traction ability. So next is the, the toe angle of the tire. So if the car is viewed from, from above like that, the front tires pointing towards each other or pointing outward. Toe out, toe in. Uh, that also does something to, uh, to the grip. And sometimes with setup guides, yeah, it, it helps turn in that sort of stuff. But we have to sort of, I think, combine the camber with the toe angle. Because camber, negative camber, creates a lateral force, even with no, I mentioned before we need slip angle we need the tire sliding over the track to generate force actually a lie if you have a tire uh, with a bit of camber it will give you a lateral force already without needing slip angle but of course typically your setup is symmetrical so the left and right tire at the same negative camber they put a force on the tire but plus 100 minus 100 equals nothing so you, you just feel a stable car but negative camber means that as you start to turn, that outside tire has negative camber and that becomes the dominant tire. It already has a force from the negative camber. 
and the rear tire might have less camber, it might have less force available when you just start steering. So initially, if you have a lot of negative camber at the front and no camber at the rear, you start to steer and the front is happy, you get good bite because it starts with a reasonable force from the camber and the rear doesn't. So that might give you a little bit of initial uh, oversteer. So the way I approach toe, which is kind of the same thing, because toe gives you slip angle effectively, the tires pointing out or pointing in when viewing the car from uh, above. This is very descriptive and everybody will understand what I do with my hands. Um, so picture on the front, um, negative camber gives you force inward and if you then add toe in it also gives you force inward because you get a slip angle and the force will point inward so with toe in with negative camber on the front axle you get even more immediate force when you start to steer on the outer dominant tire it will have slip angle already because there is toe in and it will have camber which generates force and then if we still have those rear tires without camber and without uh, any toe, they won't have any force initially. So you might get a bit of a sort of nervous initial response. The more camber you have on the front, a negative camber, that makes the front eager. You can compensate that a little bit with toe out because toe, toe out generates slip angle the other way. So you've got these forces pointing from the negative camber pointing inwards. And now you add some toe out that adds a force putting outwards. So that initial force, when you start steering, looks at, okay, this is my camber. Oh, I've got a lot of cornering force, but now I look at my toe angle. Oh, I've got force the other way. So it sort of cancels each other out. And that immediate response is reduced by having toe out on the front. At the rear, it's the same, but different. No, the other side of the car. So there, negative camber, you probably might not want as much because the tires are also driven and negative camber might mess up your uh, traction uh, grip. So that's why in order to have them uh, more sort of initially responsive when you turn, there you can add toe in, which makes everything stable, but it also gives you more immediate force on the rear tire when you start to steer. So this is my sort of approach with toe and camber uh, on the front. If you want it to turn in more, it's more immediately like you get a lot of force negative camber uh, toe in will work but typically you get too much response there and you might uh, still like the negative camber giving you the grip but you might not like the response and then toe out will sort of slow down the initial uh, response on the rear camber is probably limited to whatever you can get away with still having a good traction so with a super powerful car you might have less negative camber than with a less powerful car because you can get 200 horsepower down easier than a thousand but still once you have that camber uh, you can sort of give that rear more initial grip when you start to turn by giving it toe in that's how i look at it so uh, i com combine the camber with the toe in order to paint a picture of how initial steering goes a side note here though a lot of the time you know what i'm talking about here is really that only that initial little bit of response and if you're harsh with a lot of input it doesn't take a lot, lot of time for the car to get at the slip angle way beyond uh, where we feel these effects of the toe and the camber but really off center it does make a difference you can show it in telemetry but the, the less smooth you are the less you will feel this uh, as well well what's next let's talk about the uh, ride heights they are uh, quite interesting and can be very important as well uh, lower or higher ride height well sometimes people say well if you lower the ride height you get less weight transfer that's absolutely true however typically your range of ride height adjustments is probably not huge and five millimeters or ten millimeters ride height adjustment won't dramatically change the center of gravity height and and won't dramatically change the weight transfer typically you don't tune the the, the ride heights for uh, for weight transfer like that you want you want that to be as low as possible uh, but ride heights also give uh, sort of a limited room between the floor of the car and and the ground and perhaps you're bottoming out and then you might need stiffer springs or bump rubbers so in that sense ride height is is, is some of some importance but ride height typically is most important for uh, the aerodynamics because a lot of cars use a lot of wings and under tray and everything like that that can be really sensitive to the ride height. So uh, 
a rule of thumb with the right, right heights is that lower if more downforce at the cost of probably needing stiffer springs and getting a worse ride and, and handling everywhere because you don't want to be bottoming out all the time but still from an aerodynamic perspective lower gives more downforce and uh, if the front of the car is lower you get more downforce to the front and then if you keep raising the rear you get even more downforce on the front right so the the lower the front and the higher the rear the more the downforce moves forward that's important to realize so if you have uh, a very sort of understeery car uh, you might raise the rear height right height a little bit and sure that will increase the center of gravity height a little bit and no that's all fairly pointless compared to the aerodynamic effect of shifting the aerodynamic balance to the front can also increase front ring of wing of course or reduce rear wing but the ride heights also play a very important role with aerodynamic uh, cars another thing what that ride heights do when you adjust them you're changing the suspension geometry and that's not too obvious but what happens there if you raise or lower the ride height the links in the suspension change like the position a little bit and that will affect things like the roll center of the suspension and the roll center you can see the roll center as an anti-roll bar uh, effectively the higher the roll center is the more sort of anti-roll bar you you get and why is that important well a stiffer front anti-roll bar will give you more understeer that's fairly common and it might also happen that if you raise the right height on the front you change the geometry the roll center goes up and effectively you're creating understeer not just from raising the front right height and reducing the arrow you might also move the roll center up a little bit which effectively means uh, you've got more anti-roll bar and, and less oversteer from that as well so that's sort of a hidden effect of right heights uh, right heights themselves do not change the weight distribution of the car so you need more weight on the back you don't lower the back or something that doesn't work at all then we get to springs we need to look at the car in a few modes right so vertically it's just bouncing up and down that's uh, a vertical movement there is roll so that's vertical yeah let's do it let's visualize it that way vertical movement there's roll uh, and that's uh, things we want to separate here and vertically we have these corner springs of course we have them and but vertically when we're going over bumps the anti-roll bar doesn't do anything now when we take a corner um, we have to look at the, the regular springs and also the anti-roll bar to figure out uh, what the tire loads will be and how much grip we will have so that's important and vertically we can also feel the effect of a third spring uh, so in other words the anti-roll bar only works when the car is rolling otherwise it doesn't add any force and the third spring only adds suspension force when we're going vertically or being compressed with with downforce so why is that important well a lot of the cornering balance comes from uh, the total stiffness of every spring that is active when you have roll in the car so the normal the corner springs and the anti-roll bar most of the time so you cannot isolate these uh, effects and even the tire pressures like i mentioned play a role here so adding front anti-roll bar is actually the same uh, thing does the same thing to the balance as adding front spring or adding front tire pressure you stiffen up the front in roll and what's the theory behind that why does a stiffer front give you more understeer uh, compared to a, a softer front or why does a stiffer rear give you more oversteer the reason is when you're cornering that weight leans to one side all right and let's just make it simple and the outside two tires will get the load and what happens is if you have a very stiff front end you steer and the, the car leans the stiffer the front is the more of that weight transfer will be taken by the outside front and if you have a very stiff rear you turn in the car starts to lean and a lot of that weight transfer is taken by the rear because that's the stiffer so the stiffer side takes the more weight transfer than the softer side and in order to understand that further tire load is very important for giving you uh, the grip but tire grip does not double when tire load doubles that's a little confusing but anyway a heavily loaded tire is less happy 
than a lightly loaded tire. Absolutely it gives you more grip, but it gives you a lower friction coefficient. Yeah, this is really quite confusing, but imagine what happens if we have an ultra stiff front end and we don't have any roll stiffness in, in the rear, right? So we turn and the car starts to lean and all that load is taken by the outside front. So if we look at the outside front tire, it will have a very high load. The inside front tire will have no load and the outside two tires will have equal load because I'm leaning, but it's all taken up by the front and the rear does nothing. That means the tires on the rear are sort of an average load, both reasonably happy and the tire on the front, well, one is loaded super hard, which kind of reduces its efficiency and the other one is not loaded at all. So it doesn't give you any grip. So on average, the more equally each tire, uh, the axle is loaded. So left and right, uh, in, in this case, the rear tires are loaded evenly. The more total grip the rear tires, both of the rear tires will provide. And the front, which you made super stiff, all the weight has gone to that outside front tire. The inside front tire is almost off the ground. So we effectively rely on just one tire to give us the grip. And in that case, twice the load is not twice the grip. It won't be as happy. You will have understeer. And that's why uh, the springs and anti-roll bars and the tire pressure all go together, creating that stiffness. How much of the load transfers to the front tire and how much goes to the rear tire. So what affects this? Tire pressure I mentioned, the stiffer, the more tire pressure, the stiffer that axle becomes. And if it's the front, the stiffer it is, the more understeer you will have on the rear, the opposite. Uh, springs as well, regular springs. The stiffer you make the springs, the stiffer the axle will be in roll. And if you do it on the front, make that stiffer, you get more understeer. Oppo opposite at the back, of course. And empty roll bars, exactly the same thing. Uh, it's not just stopping the roll, so nothing to do with that. It does help reduce roll, but it's adding to the roll stiffness, which some of which you have from the spring. And then you add, if you want, you can add to that with the anti-roll bar. So the combination of the tire pressure, which is typically sort of fixed, the spring uh, and the anti-roll bar, that sets your axle stiffness. And one other thing, sadly, but you typically don't know this, another thing that sets the axle stiffness in that sense is the roll center. I briefly mentioned it, changing the ride heights. And that really depends on the suspension geometry. The higher the roll center is, front and rear, um, the more anti-roll bar effect you have. So you cannot say if you have equal front and rear springs, equal front and rear anti-roll bars, that your uh, when you steer, that 50% of the weight transfer goes to the front and 50% goes to the rear. You can't quite say that because perhaps at the back the roll center is higher than at the front. You know, this gets complicated quite soon, but just remember that when you're steering in roll, in cornering, you want the stiffness of the spring and of the anti-roll bar combined, those two together. That gives you the understeer or oversteer. Stiffer is understeer on the front. Another thing to add to this front and rear stiffness thing that I mentioned in cornering, stiff front axle, more understeer because inside tire, no grip, low load outside tire a lot of load but it get overloaded and the rear tires with no roll stiffness have equal load and they both do sort of half the the load half the grip they are happy it's not just when cornering it's also when accelerating so look at this amazing drawing of a gt ish car so it's driving meow, forward like that hello uh, here we have the rear tires and imagine that situation, right? So super stiff front and no roll stiffness at the rear. There's equal tire load available on the rear tires. That also gives them equal traction. And if the traction is from this wheel, it tries to rotate the car that way. If the traction is from that wheel, it tries to rotate the car the other way. And that's because the center of gravity is here in the middle. And if you apply a force here, you get rotation that way. If you apply force to that side of the center of gravity, you get rotation the other way. If these are equal, then these rotations are also equal, and you get no sort of rotation from going on the throttle with a setup like that. So that's no rear roll stiffness, very rare, of course, and that doesn't really exist. But now imagine if we take, uh, we, we reverse the setup. So we have a very soft front with no roll stiffness and a super firm rear suspension. What happens now? In the same drawing, um, one tire here gets all the load and the other has no load. Uh, 
then this rotation won't happen because we don't have a force here. We have no load on the tire, so we have to sort of... That's my middle finger again, I'm sorry about that. We don't have this uh, force here, which means we also don't have this rotation. We only have the other side that gets all the load, gets all the force, and that gets to rotate the car more. So if you have a stiff rear uh, compared to the front, you will also get a lot more oversteer, not just mid-corner, but also on the throttle, because the outside tire will get the most uh, load. And it that the stiffer the rear is, the more likely it is that only the outside rear tire will be able to push the car forward with, with traction. And if it's on the outside, it wants to rotate and cause oversteer even more. This also ties into the next topic, that's the differential. And especially when the rear tires are unequally loaded, typically all the time when cornering. Just an extreme example that I mentioned where we have no rear stiffness or super rear stiffness. Something in between will be more, more likely. So your mid-corner, the outside rear tire will have more load on it than the inside rear tire. And the differential sort of stops all the traction going to that inside wheel and that spins up and you leave a lot of smoke while the heavily loaded outside wheel that you rely on for the most grip, the most traction out of the corner, doesn't get the force. So it's important to realize what with a limited slip differential, you can sort of lock the rear tires together and in when uh, preventing one from spinning like crazy and the other from getting no force. But what you have to keep in mind is that with the differential, you're sort of, with a corner exit, you're changing these arrows, right? And the more force you have on one side, the more rotation you get this way, the more force you have on middle finger, sorry, the other side, the more rotation you get the other way. So with, with more diff lock, you're allowing the outer tire, let's say it's, it's this one, uh, to get a lot of traction as well, even when the inside tire is lightly loaded and that won't generate as much force. So your differential lock sort of sets these arrows that we've just looked at and how much rotation you can get. So assuming sort of an average case where the outside rear tire is more heavily loaded than the inside rear tire, we need some sort of a differential in order to stop that inside tire from spinning. However, if we have an open diff, that inside tire uh, might start spinning and we don't get a lot of force on the outside tire. And remember, driving force on the outside tire gives you more rotation and driving force on the inside tire stops rotation. So the more lock you add, the more traction can be given by the outside uh, rear tire, which will give you more oversteer. If you have too much lock, a lot of lock, it might also sort of tie the rear tires together. And then at low speed, for example, you have a, you've got a hairpin and you apply a little bit of throttle and the rear tires are not even allowed to spin at a slightly different speed and you might get some push as well. So there's more to the differential than just the example I've just given you. But I think that's sort of a good way to look at it with the car from above. Does the force occur on the outside tire, more rotation? Does the driving force occur on the inside tire, uh, less rotation? Then we have the third springs, uh, some more advanced like uh, formula cars and, and MP cars have that. Uh, they only work when the car is going vertical. They are typically used when you have a lot of downforce, the car is sort of going lower and lower and almost pressed onto, uh, onto the road. Now you can of course make the cornering springs a lot stiffer and that will also make it harder for the, t for the car to be bottoming out from the downforce. But the problem is then you get a very high stiffness uh, to cope with the downforce. And then when you're going through corners, there is a real stiff suspension and that might not have enough compliance and it might not work as well and might not give you uh, the behavior over curbs or over bumps. It might not work quite as well. So that's why they found out the more downforce you have, if you can add this third spring, it only works vertically and doesn't affect with the roll, then you can have better ride height control, which is ideal for the downforce to keep the ride heights in the window where the downforce works best while not affecting uh, the roll. So if you increase the third spring on, on the front, for example, um, you will make it vertically stiffer. And that might very well mean that the ride heights change less. And that might very well mean that you get uh, more understeer, I don't know. But it's not 
because you add the spring rate because we in cornering that doesn't work we need the regular springs and the anti-roll bar for cornering right so it doesn't affect cornering balance directly from from the weight transfer but the first spring will affect the ride heights and ride heights might affect aerodynamic uh, balance and, and handling so front and rear third springs are sort of more your ride height control as you go faster and faster on the straight because this downforce moves around probably quite a lot uh, based on the difference in front and rear ride height. So if you have understeer in high speed corners, for example, perhaps it might make sense to have a higher rear ride height there. But you could, of course, just increase the rear ride height or you make that third spring stiffer and the rear will move down less as the downforce comes in. And that's sort of a thing that typically the third springs are used for a ride height control for the downforce. Bump rubbers are another thing that are sort of typical. Um, ideally, often when the car has a lot of downforce, the bump rubbers typically work on the third spring. And what they do, they just make the spring stiffer. They are uh, rubbers inside the coilover. Uh, they just add another sort of progressive spring to the already existing uh, third spring. So that makes the car go lower and lower with downforce. But that bump rubber is getting really stiff and it will try to prevent the car from going much lower. And this is another ride height control on the third uh, spring. So it's really important to tune that for high speed corners, for example. Make those ride heights uh, such that you have a nice balance in the corners uh, at high speed with, uh, with a lot of downforce. And at lower speed, downforce isn't as effective. And then you probably want to tune... The, the balance more with uh, the, the combination of the springs and the anti-roll bar and that those work more clearly uh, they work all the time but you feel them isolated better at low speed and the faster you go the more the aerodynamics will also play a role and they might even uh, outweigh the other set of uh, parameters at that point when you have uh, bump rubbers on the regular springs, uh, that can also be interesting. So uh, GT cars apparently have that these days because they are so aerodynamic and they don't want the ride heights to uh, move too much in order to get the most from, uh, from the downforce. Here's another thing that you should not forget. I mentioned in roll, uh, you need the springs and anti-roll bar, but these springs, when you use bump rubbers, are not constant. So the stiffer your bump rubber is, the stiffer that suspension, that front axle becomes if you're talking about the front bump rubbers. And the more understeer you might get because the front is effectively stiffer because of the bump rubbers and you'll get more uh, understeer uh, as a result of that. Now, this is all a balance thing because you might need the stiff uh, springs and bump rubbers to get the aerodynamics to work properly. At the same time, this gives you sort of a non-linear a speed sensitive understeer because the more speed you have the more downforce the more stiff the front axle becomes from the bump rubbers which are progressively stiffer and stiffer and the more understeer you get from the front axle being so stiff so you might have to use a bit more front wing or perhaps reduce re rear wing a little bit because the bump rubbers make the front axle super stiff and all the time when i talk about aerodynamics it's very important to realize that the front ride height is typically a lot more important than the rear ride height especially on uh, single seaters most of the time the optimal downforce is like between zero and five millimeters ride height on the front and the higher you go the more downforce you lose and if you go five or ten millimeters higher or lower on the rear ride height it's not too big a deal so the front ride height is critical and that's why typically the front is also stiffer to make sure the ride height doesn't change uh, as much. But beware, bump rubbers on the corner uh, springs will also affect the stiffness of the axle and be the same as increasing an anti-roll bar, for example. Well, when you talk about the bump rubbers, typically there might be packers or some way to adjust the gap. And the gap is, first there's just a spring, and then perhaps after the spring has compressed a certain amount, then there's a little bump rubber that will sort of become active and, and squish. Uh, that's also an important part that tunes basically with downforce. How fast do you have to go? How far does the suspension have to be compressed before the bump rubber becomes active? And uh, that really depends uh, on, on, your, uh, on your setup. It also can make it more complicated because at low speeds, for example, without a lot of downforce, if you have bump rubbers on the corners, you start to steer and it's all good and well. You're not on the bump rubbers. And then in a higher speed corner, 
the car is compressed down more, you steer and the front get actually stiffer because at that point you are using the bump rubbers. So I hope you're confused yet because this is uh, tends to be really confusing stuff. So the next almost magical topic is uh, dampers. And I think my explanation for them is, is fairly simple. And uh, these are some sometimes sort of elevated to sort of magic proportions. And I'll try to simplify them a lot. So, so far we mentioned springs and bump rubbers, which are effectively springs. And they give a force based on how far you compress it. If you have a spring here, you compress it. And the further you compress it, the harder it presses back. That's what springs and bump rubbers uh, do. So it's based on the deflection, you get a force. Dampers, they give a force based on how fast you're moving. So if you have, if imagine I have a damper here, I move it slowly, it's easy. And the faster I want to move it, the harder it gets. And of course the suspension is always going uh, like this on a racing car, because you're always going over bumps or there's always weight transfer. So the suspension is doing this all the time. And the dampers sort of react with a force based on how quickly the suspension moves. Now, the way I look at it, um, if you're cornering in your racing car on a bumpy uh, track, uh, the dampers that are stiffer, uh, they resist that movement. And effectively, on the front, if you have lots of damping, very stiff dampers, they increase the stiffness again of the front axle. So that gives you understeer. And on the rear, if you get, have them very loose, they will uh, not stiffen up the suspension over those bumps. And that will give you even uh, more understeer because the rears have more grip. So I picture the dampers as fairly simple, uh, sort of, they add stiffness to the suspension when the suspension is moving, which is a lot of the time in, in, in racing cars. So for cornering balance, it might make a, a difference if you have stiffer front and softer rear, you have more understeer. And if you have stiffer rear and softer front dampers, that might give you more oversteer over bumps when the suspension is doing this. If you're on a billiard tr flat track surface, then the dampers really don't do all that much because the suspensions are very stiff and effectively the time it takes for when you steer for the car to roll is almost nothing. And as long as there are some dampers there, if there were no bumps, you wouldn't feel a cornering balance difference between having stiff or soft dampers. But reality of racetracks with bumps is that all the time the suspension is doing this so the dampers are always adding force and depending depending on how stiff your dampers are if you add force to the front axle you get more understeer if you add force to the rear axle you get more oversteer so that's one way to look at the dampers and then of course we have slow and fast dampers and here's something you hear a lot uh, the fast dampers Oh yeah, those are when you hit a curb and the, and the suspension moves, gets a hit and it moves real fast. True-ish, but dampers are not intelligent. They're just simple things. And it's not so that like if you look at the slow damping and the fast damping that you can just look at, well, I'm taking a, a track with lots of curbs and, and I want to hit these curbs. So uh, I don't want the car to be affected. So I just reduce the fast bump and I'm done. No. Uh, you cannot bypass the slow stage, right? So if the damper moves slow, like this, you'll feel the slow bump. And then I move fast. You don't just feel the fast bumping damping. No, you feel the slow bump plus the fast bump. So the slow bump is still important when taking curves because, well, it depends a lot on the damper at what, at what speed be the, does the fast bumping uh, come into play. But the slow bumping uh, slow bump damping is always active and even when you take a curb and uh, just a tiny bit more about dampers uh, I've only talked about them in the cornering situation where I mentioned the more you sort of have the suspension moving stiffer dampers stiffen up the front axle if you have stiff dampers on the front and it gives you more understeer and the other way around of course aerodynamics tend to be very dominant in, in racing cars and perhaps tuning the dampers not so much for suspension behavior but more for tuning the ride heights of the car from not going up and down too quickly it might also be uh, a thing worth doing that perhaps the handling over bumps and curbs isn't great but if a certain damper gives you a more stable ride heights then the aerodynamics might work better 
but another thing to keep in mind is that it's not just the springs and the dampers of the car we have these uh, tires on each corner hopefully they're still attached if they're not your well a, a car setup guide isn't what you should be reading uh, but the tires are undamped so they're very bouncy by themselves and this is an interesting thing that i haven't really uh, been sort of diving into yet but i have this feeling that sure you can go super stiff with your springs bump rubbers and dampers that doesn't mean your ride heights will be controlled over bumps because the stiffer your suspension and dampers are the more the car will just sort of bounce on its undamped very stiff tires so regarding ride height control for aero yes dampers and springs will affect it but you can also trust on those bouncy tires to make the ride heights go up and down no matter what sort of perfect uh, spring and damper combination uh, you have it might be that at some point you can go too stiff with your suspension and your dampers that you get ride height oscillations that you're trying to prevent by going with more uh, stiffer uh, springs and more damping so that the bouncy tires are unavoidable and they are a big part of uh, the car as well another car setup thing you can typically adjust is with the brakes you can adjust the brake balance that's kind of speaks for itself how much braking is done by the front and by the rear um, you might feel that if you have too much braking at the rear it might start to move around uh, under braking which can be sort of an ideal way to start feeling uh, the balance of the car and something like a Porsche Cup car the rear might start moving around a bit uh, under braking but also if you brake too much and you do some trail braking into a corner if there's too much braking at the rear uh, the braking grip might eat away some of the cornering grip and it might get oversteery so I think brake bias is sort of self-explanatory but uh, there's also a thing called brake pressure which tends to be adjustable in most sims and there's a trend that I sometimes see also with customers from from the pedals that you want to avoid lockup and you can do that by making the brakes weaker of course you can just as long as you have more tire grip and you have a racing car and then you install tiny little weak brakes you can't lock them up but you can also not slow down quickly so my advice is to always uh, start with the highest brake pressure available in in the sim and then if you have lockup it's up to you to learn how to use your brake pedal to avoid it problem is if you reduce the brake pressure at some point you will also be taking uh, brake performance away you always want the brakes to be strong enough to lock the tires so I think it's a mistake to go for lower brake pressures just because that reduces lockups especially on high downforce cars initially at high speed you can use a lot of brake pressure you just have to come off the brake pedal as the speed drops but it's much better to learn how to use your brake pedal than to cheat well you're cheating yourself out of lap time by using a lower brake pressure in in the game so bump that up and learn how to drive uh, without lockups okay well um, like i said i was just going to ramble about this for uh, a while uh, i will edit this together and i must have missed things uh, but i hope i've given you a slightly alternative look on some of the most common car setup changes that you can uh, make and correct my mistakes below uh, ask questions suggestions everything and perhaps that was interesting like I said I could do a more detailed version but I'd be spending a week and I want it to be perfect this is just rambling quick edit and send it out there hoping that it's useful to uh, some of you without me spending too much time and getting gray hairs which I'm already kind of getting slowly not really there more there man man <laughs> cut cut so I hope you found that somewhat interesting uh, discuss below and uh, mistakes or things I missed I'm uh, I'll be uh, reading it. Bye-bye.